Hey, welcome to the special CUBE Conversation feature presentation, Preparing Developers for AI and Generative AI. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE here in Palo Alto. We've got a great remote guest, Kim. Tim, folks, Aerospikes, Aerospikes Chief Developer Advocate. Tim, thanks for coming on. Thanks, I really appreciate you having me. And um, yeah, I know my title's a bit of a mouthful, but you did a great job, so <laughs> thank you. First of all, uh, Chief Developer, it was awesome. So look, this is a big topic. I mean, I, I've been shouting at the top of my lungs for a couple of years now, as cloud was kind of going next level. You saw Amazon set the table, everyone else jumped on with the hyperscalers. Aerospike, you guys have been doing real-time data for a long, long time in, in, in well, high-frequency trading, ad tech, all those high-end applica applications. But we started to see the formation a few years ago where if you're building an ecosystem on top of a cloud, you have platforms and platforms require data. And we were always saying that the role of data would be very important where developers would be coding with data in line and not just using data. And so with generative AI, we're seeing the role of data become super important because it's generative. It means it's generating like a runtime environment for assembling stuff, data and content, multimodal. So, the notion of shift left for security, which is a cloud native term, you start to see the same concept for developers. And you're starting to see early signs of with the large language models and the complex neural network multimodal capabilities. So we are right in line. That's where all the hype is and that's where all the action is from a developer standpoint. So, I mean, this is like the perfect storm where this is going to sh shift the game a bit from where it was and to where a new, a new paradigm. Could you share your thoughts on that? First, do you agree? I'm sure you'd agree, but uh, give me your reaction to that. Yeah, perfect. Um, it, it's an interesting world we live in. Like we have the, for the longest time, experienced developers have been the ones who've been the mentors. They've said, yeah, I know how this is going. Um, it's standard building blocks and they can uh, mentor new and upcoming people. Now we've got this whole paradigm shift where technology is moving at such a pace and the ecosystem has moved at such pace. The people who are the coming straight out of university are more versed than the people who are more mentoring. And there's so many moving pieces and they're so novel. How they hang together is, um, it, it's almost frustrating for the experienced developers. And I say this from my own personal perspective because I was exactly in this camp a few months ago. You hear all these terms, how do you put them together? How do you get a generative AI application that's going to work at scale when you don't understand what large language models and vectors and things like that are? It's really, really interesting about how they're going to get forward from there. Um, and you know, the, the paradigm shifts are just incredible. You know, we're not used to doing fuzzy things. We're used to getting an answer out of a computer. We're not used to having, hey, I'm going to make some stuff up because I'm a computer and I'm going to hallucinate about things. <laughs> and so there's all this new technology and the way they hang together is really interesting, um, but it's a bit of a mind shift for the experienced developers out there in particular. We're going to get into a, a plug for the event that's coming up that you guys are having real-time data summit on June 25th. Uh, and that's a gathering of not just Aerospike, but the industry ecosystem coming together. Because as you said, computers were not built for hallucinating. That is a side effect of the new platform shift. And new platform shift went from the old way of you code stuff and you get a response. Things are programmatic, it's deterministic in some levels. And now you have a new model where you don't know what you're going to get. And oftentimes it's not the same answer because it's generating and the data drives that. And everyone kind of now sees that and they go, oh wow, that's huge. Then they go, okay, now what do we do? Right? So there's a whole nother um, set of tooling, a set of replatforming, a set of activities are going on in, in large companies and, and whether it's hyperscale for the consumer or just an enterprise. So this is now the mandate. Okay, so that rolls right to the developer because when the, the CXOs and the board says, we need a generative AI strategy, guess where it falls? To the operators, the IT and the developers. And then the developers say, well, what do I do? How do I prepare? What is my readiness plan? How do I prepare for AI and what do I do? Is it part of my workflow? So this is, these are the open questions. This is what everyone is talking about right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a very interesting scenario because obviously, as you mentioned, you've got the traditional um, applications where I've got my relational databases, my NoSQL databases, I get my information out of there. And then suddenly I'm asked to do this AI, how do I integrate that? Um, and I've been on this journey for a while now, and it's really fascinating to see how it fits. It's not the answer that everyone's looking for. It's, you know, 
everyone's used to the chat GPT stuff, mm. um, sort of things where they say, yes, um, I can give it some information and it'll give me some answers. And it might be right, it might be wrong. But how do I embed that into an application? You know, a help website makes sense, but there's other things we can do. You know, fraud detection and um, things like recommendation engines really have great benefits in um, the use of AI technologies, these sort of fuzzy searches to say, I've gone and searched for something, I want to find something that is related to it. How am I going to do that? Um, so it's not just the generative side of things, it's the whole AI ecosystem and plugging that into your traditional applications and having the two liaise together in the right manner so you get the best application results. To me as a developer, that's really what I find exciting. Um, but there's there's weird things along the way. Yeah, well, let's get into um, that. Let's, like, get, let's get into that because I want to get into the, to the the developer impact. So you just hit mm -hmm. you just hit the nail on the head. At the end of the day, you're already starting to see the developers jump on the bandwagon now and, and start coding. In obviously in the high end, it's the large language models and people are pouring billions of dollars into those consumer like startups. But if you look at the enterprise, the app market, it's very much about working with the data that they have. That's why retrieval augmentation generation is so popular because you could do that. It's text and there's some things you can get your hands on. Now you got multimodal, you got images, you got PDFs, you got graphics, you got computer vision. So now that's coming to the table. So developers are are creating vector databases. Let's let's get into that because this is where the application and the infrastructure and the middleware come together. Take us through what developers are dealing with right now to, to set the table for to, for building, you know, robust applications with multimodal capabilities. Mhm. Mm yeah, so I mean, the, the first part is obviously the large language models. Um, they've got to be able to understand what they're doing with their inputs. And so, as you said, it's multimodal. I, I've got inputs of video and um, audio and um, e even things like business objects. So if you're doing a recommendation engine, you want the business objects that represent your data in there. So it's a combination of all these factors. And you've got to imply use a large, large language model to do something useful with it. But without having some context for those large language models, then they are most likely to hallucinate a lot. They're prone to these sort of hallucinations unless you can give it context. Now, one of the things I found fascinating when I started doing these um, LLMs was you don't program it in the traditional sense. You tell it in your native language, English in my case, what you wanted to do. And you say, hey, you're an expert on Aerospike, for example, and I want you to tell me about or answer my questions in the best manner using this information. It's not writing code, it's writing English. This prompt engineering is absolutely fascinating. Um, and you know th that was one of the things that I was really surprised about. And the ecosystem, all these pieces that move together, um, you know, you've got the, the LLMs, you've got the prompt engineering, you've got your vector databases so that you can get the right sort of information out of all your inputs and give it the answer. Um, and then accuracy. It's a fuzzy search. It's meant to be, I don't necessarily want an exact answer. I want things that are related to it. How do you know you've got the closest relation ones? If it's a traditional relational database, as you know, you give it an input, you get an answer, and you give it the same input, it'll always be the same answer. Fuzzy searches aren't necessarily like that. It depends on a whole number of factors. So there's going to be an, a set of ecosystem tools around, is this the right answer? How do I actually know? It's an approximate nearest neighbor search as we all tend to use in vector databases. How approximate is it? Yeah. Is it the right information or is it wrong information? Well, well so, this brings up a good question. Demystify the vector um, um, database angle because uh, give us the, the basics because this is where you're starting to see unstructured data come in in massive scale. The old days you have to crawl it, you index it and, and query it. Now you have vector, uh, which has been around for a while, but it's being the number one application because it's got that neural graph-like capabilities. Can you explain to us quickly, demystify the vector scene, why it's popular and why it's being used so much? Yeah, in fact, I'm giving a whole talk about this at Summit, so I'm um, really excited to do so. Um, vectors are these mystical concepts, but they're really easy. It's just a set of numbers. Um, and people are used to lossy style algorithms where I take my inputs, be it a video, be it an audio. Um, let's think of an image. I've got a picture. I run a lossy algorithm like JPEG on it. It loses information and turns it into a smaller representation of the same thing. That's exactly what a vector does. It takes whatever input it has, be it an audio file or a question you give it, and it turns it into a series of numbers. And that's all it is. Now, it might be large dimensionality. You know, we've got vectors that can be up to thousands of dimensions. And then it's a vector database. All it does is it looks at these 
hundreds or thousands of dimensions of vectors and says, you've given me one, find me the ones that are closest to it. And it does some form of fancy algorithm, uh, typically something like a hierarchical, navigatable, small world um, algorithm to work out which ones are closest. Um, so it's a really fun and interesting algorithm, but just the usage of it and just what you can do with it, I find totally fascinating. And, and, and the way it could get uh, the similar access across billions of data points is interesting. It, the speed of it is amazing because of the, its math. It has nothing to do with context other than tokens, uh, which Great. brings up a good point. Can you explain this why, I mean, I already know the answer, but I'll just, for the sake of getting it out there, but I want you to explain in your terms. Context window and tokens. Jensen Wong, the CEO of NVIDIA, when I talked to him at his GDC conference, when he was talking about the platform shift with NVIDIA's driving, he says, we're going to live in a token world where everything's a token. And, and tokens are a part of this. Can you connect the dots between vectors, tokens, and why that matters and why this context window, when people say my context window is bigger, which means you can do more, explain what that means. Okay, so a context typically is more related to an LLM rather than a vector. So when you, Let's say we're, um, we're, we're asking a question about uh, from a chatbot. We've taken uh, the question, we've turned it into a vector using an algorithm. We've run our semantic search across our database and found the appropriate vectors which are closest. And then we need to turn it back. The vectors have no meaning in their own right. What those vectors do is they point back to a source document, which might be a video file or a text file or something that gives it context. We then need to take that context and give it to the LLM because the LLM itself is pre-trained on a set of data. If you don't give it any specific data, it's going to give you either a hallucination or something that might've been pre-trained a long time ago on. You wanted to give an answer based on that context. So what it's going to do is it's going to take that information, that context, turn it into tokens that it understands, um, and then apply the LLM algorithm on top of it. And that will give it the information it knows that it needs to be able to give you a meaningful answer. So it's part of that it's related to vectors in that you take the vectors, do the similarity search, and get the output of those, um, the source documents related to those vectors on it. Yeah. But then it has to be tokenized. And context windows says, I only have a small amount of data I can give, or I have a huge amount of data I can give. Um, and so you don't want to give it yeah. too much because then it gives it the wrong answer. And they're typically very finite in the size of their token windows. So the, um, they're getting much bigger. So the bigger the window, Okay, the more tokens you have and the more compute you have, the faster the application is. Yes, no. but probably better, the more accurate the answer can be. Yeah. Um, so it's better to hold a conversation. Imagine you're having a session where you're having a conversation with the, um, uh, the, the chat GPT or whatever it is. You wanted to remember what you've said in the past. That's more tokens for it to decide what to do with. Um, the bigger the context window, the more it can remember, the more documents it can get at. So it's really fascinating how much that limits us. Um, if we're just looking at documents on a website, for example, you might be surprised how many tokens you get out of a single document, and that might overflow the bounds of a single LLM, depending on which LLM you're using. Now to bring this full speed back to the developers that remind, you know, bring all this together, it's a system, you know, and, and if you want memory, you got to add more tokens. You want to take the, the math, connect it to a token from the document, assemble it, link it, compile it. It sounds like it's like a, it's an operating system. It's like, it sounds like the, it's getting, so from an application standpoint, if I'm a developer, I got to look at this and say to myself, I have to work with this. Can you, can you, can you uh, share your thoughts on this kind of direction? I mean, I'm kind of, I took some liberties with, you know, the comparisons of compilers, but it is kind of linking. I mean, you're saying, okay, there's the vectors, there's the yep. token, there's the document, link it, present it. I mean, that's a computer yep. paradigm. Yeah, it's very much a pipeline. You have a series of steps and each step has a set of inputs and outputs and you're pipelining them together and moving data from one to the other and it's being transformed as you're going through. Um, the thing that's fascinating to me also is I've done, I've been around for a very long time. You can probably tell by just by looking at me. Um, I've been doing computers all my life. I understand it bits and bytes how a typical computer program works and how databases works and stuff like that. But large language models, how do they work? I don't necessarily understand it. They're more building blocks and you're yeah. basically building these pipelines which are tying these building blocks together without needing or even being able to understand how they've necessarily derived the answer. It's really complex mathematics when you start getting down into that level. Um, and so I suspect a lot of developers will do a lot of the pipeline building mm -hmm. and tying it together without necessarily knowing exactly how it works. Um, and that's 
a very unusual concept for me. We talked to your uh, colleague Lendley earlier and, and we were talking about how LLMs will work each other. Like you said, they're black boxes or Lego blocks or just you know um, building blocks. They're like almost like a procedure you can call or a library. It, it's like, but most of the action with the developers will be standing up their own data pipelines to use a you know generic term, but crafting their own and developing their own data, what do you call it? I mean, fabric, data network, graph. I mean, so it's again, we're back into the developer. I'm the developer, I got to know this. I got to have someone prepare mm -hmm. the data. So this is the challenge. Where, is the, where do we cross the line from data ops to coding in line? I mean, that's the question uh, that I'm, I'm curious about. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, the other thing that is relevant to that is those models, there are literally hundreds of thousands free open source models out there. How do you know which one to pick? It's not like the traditional building blocks you're used to where I've got my data and I want to go and store it in a hash table. Well, everyone's got a hash table, they all do exactly the same thing. These hundreds of thousands of models do slightly different things. Um, some are you know, great for image recognition, some are great at understanding human language, some are great at recommendations. You've got to find the right model as well. And these building blocks and flowing the data between them depends very much on a whole number of dimensions. How many dimensions of your vector are you storing? You know, am I turning it into a thousand numbers or 500 numbers? That makes a big difference. Which algorithm am I using? Um, there's a lot of moving dials, not even considering the prompt engineering, but there's so many moving pieces. Um, there's a lot of trial and error and people are going to get very frustrated as they start getting this and go, I'm getting the wrong answers. Even though my data is correct, I'm getting the wrong answers. Which part is wrong? You know, Timmonson, you mentioned the comment about, you said you kind of joking on about yourself being old. If you look at successful people today in this, this emerging shift and this inflection point, it's both generations. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the systems generation of the 80s and 90s meeting the younger generation. You mentioned people coming out of school. So you have the systems revolution folks from the old, old days. There's almost a renaissance of systems thinking. And you're seeing the young folks come out at university. It's like the classes they've taken maybe as freshmen might be even obsolete today. I mean, we just had a big debate last week at the Snowflake Summit about the, the great ice, iceberg debate, you know, open, open data format. So you're starting to get into a world now where everything's connecting and, and, and from a systems perspective at the top of the stack, not just lower at the silicon level. So you know, what's your reaction to that? And, and how, do you, how do you make that, how, how do we make, sort, sort through all this if you're a developer? <laughs> Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, there's obviously tools out there which can help. You know, Langchain is obviously one of the standards that is emerging. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of direction we need to go. I mean, when I'm querying my relational database, I don't need to put guardrails on my queries to make sure it's not going to show me bad things. I do with my LLMs. Um, there's all these standards that are going to have to come. There's, um, you know, I foresee a lot of regulation about this and standardizing on things that make it easy to be able to develop applications with the right technology without having to do all this trial and error. Um, as far as I've seen today, that to those tools are not there. Mm -hmm. um, the people who came have, are fresh out of university, they have some background. Even if the information is obsolete because it was given to them three years ago, they still have the background. A lot of the classical developers don't. They've heard of AI and the pipelines and they know the systems architecture. And it's really going to be a fusion of that. It's not going to be so much a mentor and a mentoree anymore, but I know this part, I know this part, let's work together and form the basis. And the standards that will come out will be very interesting to watch. It's definitely an emerging space we're living in at the moment. Yeah, it's a systems revolution up and down the stack. I love it. Final question for you, multimodal database. I love the positioning. I love what you guys are doing. I love what the, the event's all about. It's a, it's a collection of, of leaders, Databricks, AWS. Um, you got a bunch, Red Panda, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Google. People coming together for the real-time data summit on, on June 25th in North America and June 26th for uh, EMEA, Europe, Europe, Middle East and Africa. What's the purpose? Is it to get developers aware? Is it to figure out as, a, as an organization and a community to figure out what the standards should be? Uh, is, it open, is it an open forum? What's the objective? What's the goal of, this, of the system? Uh, the, the summit is to present different viewpoints on different things. So I know I'm, I'm presenting on the very basics of vectors and vector databases. My colleague, Arthur Anderson, is taking that a step forward and looking at how we use multimodal and how we use generative AI. 
I'm very excited about some of the other talks we've got. Um, you know, Albert Alton from the Trade Desk is doing a great job, as always, um, on presenting more classical data concepts. So everyone's got different viewpoints. It's not necessarily fundamentally about AI, but there's a lot of AI focus and different technologies that will help in the AI stacks. You know, we've got people from AWS and Google coming. Um, it's going to be a really exciting time, and there's going to be a lot of things for developers, but also things for business people, um, for people all up and down the stack who have anything to do with data. So it should be a fantastic summit. I'm really excited. Uh, it's interesting. In real time data used to be very much focused on certain applications, low latency. Again, mostly Wall Street, ad tech, big, big volumes, a lot of, lot of memory involved. Now main, it's mainstream because AI needs the real time data to either set context mm -hmm. or not, or to what to put into either cold storage or hot storage. I mean, all kinds of interactions between infrastructure and application. And you know, as Apple pointed out on their recent worldwide developer conference, you know, you're processing inference at the, in the device. Okay, so mm -hmm. you have device to core, end to end work streams. It's the horizontal scalability, but yet you need to have low latency. This has become a, this is a technical challenge. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? It is, and the amount of data is not just constrained to a, um, the pipelines we've been discussing. The training of the neural networks, I mean, that requires a lot of data and it needs to be fast. So you can train the data, um, train the models faster. The real-time data is here. Um, anyone who's looked at any real-time decisioning, yes, you're using AI to make the decisions typically, but the more data you can feed the, date, the pipelines, um, the better results you're going to get. And we've seen this, you know, it's come to the forefront recently because of recent innovations. But at Aerospike, I've been watching this for the eight years that I've been here um, and watching people who need more and more data and the data scientists are saying, if I can get 10 times as much data, I can give you a better fraud result, for example. Yeah. Um, so yes, the revolution is here. And honestly, you know, one of the reasons I love Aerospike is because it's really positioned for yeah. I need super low latency across vast data volumes. And you know, that's what we're really here for. And that's going to be a real great um, technology and platform for all the work being done at the, you know, just all the training, inference, reinforced learning. This is like, a, this is now mainstream feature, not just a one-off kind of like a, a category. It's a global category for you guys. So props to Aerospike and congratulations and looking forward to hearing more at the event and congratulations and vectors. And thanks for sharing the data because we're going to ingest this and vectorize it and we'll apply some tokens to it because this is data that you're sharing here in theCUBE. We'll, we'll, we'll apply it to our retrieval. Tim, thank Excellent. you. Thank you very much. Well, I really appreciate you having me on this show, show John, and um, thank you very much. Okay, I'm John Furrier here for theCUBE. Check out the Real Time Summit. The leaders in the industry are getting together to start setting the agenda for the next generation, generative AI infrastructure convergence. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching.